Hello and welcome to a Last of Merry Romance. When last we left, um, John Crow was being admonished by J uh, Mary about how he had been acting around his, her um, her boss, or I don't know, her lady of ownership. He was so astonished at the flashing eyes and the white face that his eyes and mouth opened with a blank, idiot look. His expression, in fact, was so exactly like one of those pictures of human beings that school children draw on their slates that Mary could not refrain from a faint smile. You see, John dear, she said more, most, more gently, it would be very hard for me to get another job. If Miss Drew gave me notice, I'd be penniless. I'd have to be a governess or a companion with someone else. That would almost certainly mean my leaving Gladstonebury. You don't expect to follow me above all about all over England, do you, while I work at people's houses? <clears throat> but I'm going to get work myself here and soon, too, he protested. Evan knows lots of people. He's going to help me. He's going to take me this very afternoon to see his cousin, Mrs. Jeard. Mrs. Jeard and Mr. Evans are both rises, if you know what that means. At any rate, you know too well who the Geards are. Mary did smile outright at that. She shook her head. They call ditches about here by some funny name like that. No, Ryan, that's it, not Rice. But won't Philip be furious if you go and see these Jeards? I don't give a damn what about Philip. I hate the fellow. I'll make this Jeard chap give me work. He ought to do something for some of us. Any decent man would after clearing like all that. And Evan says he's all right. But it would hurt Philip terribly, wouldn't it, and Aunt Elizabeth too, if you really did take money from these persons? Does your friend know if this geared man is going to go on living here? Certainly he is. Mrs. Jeard, who's a rise. And don't you forget that, Mary, for God knows all that means. Has been three times already to look at a place over there. He swung around at his heel and pointed in a sloping ridge not far from the tour. A place they call Chalice House. So they're going to stay there... Don't air of fear. I tell you, my, my treasure, you needn't worry. It's going to be all right. We'll go on meeting in that same place in the ruins where we did the first time. And as soon as I get work, I will be married. And the devil fly away with your old lady. Wow. Mary seized his wrists with all her fingers and lifted it to her mouth. I have a great mind to punish you for behaving so badly, she murmured. There was something about the smell of John's bony hand that made her homesick for Noah folk. It smells like peat, she thought, and she began licking with the tip of her tongue the little hairs which were now tickled her lips. This gave her a sharp tingling sensation that ran through her whole frame. In a flash, she imagined herself stretched out in a bed by John's side. Oh, my dear, oh, my dear, she sighed. Take care, my treasure, they'll see us, he whispered. Wait till tomorrow afternoon. About half past two, eh? When your old lady is asleep, I'll wait for you, so don't you get agitated, even if you can't get away for hours. I'll wait there till they close up the whole place. I'll walk out a bit, you know, and come back. It's dry in that little chapel, even if it's raining outside. Oh, that's hot. <clears throat> Thus they talked by the gate, unwilling to separate, hugging each other, though they were not actually touching each other now. As tightly as if they were stark naked, but with no wild, irresistible push of passion. They were Norfolk crows, crows from Norwich, from Thorpe, from Yaxham, from Thetford, from East Durham, from Cringeford, from Methwold. Their love was lust, a healthy, earthy, muddy, weather-washed rust, like the love of water rats in Elder Dyke or the lake of love, the love of badgers on Brandon Heath. They were shamelessly devoid of any ideal love. Both to belong to each other by the same primordial law that made the Egyptian Ptolemies marry their sisters. They accepted their fatal monogamy as if it were the most casual of sensual attractions. And in the etheric atmosphere above these two, as they stood there, quivered the memorial mystery of Glastonbury. Christians had once named for this power. The ancient heathen inhabitants of the place had another, and a quite different one. Everyone who came to the spot seemed to draw something from it, attracted by a magnetism too powerful for anyone to resist. But as different people approached it, they changed its chemistry, though not its essence, by their own identity, so that upon none of them it had the same physical effect. 
This influence was personal and yet impersonal. It was a material center of force and yet an immaterial fountain of life. It had its own sui generis, origin of the, in the nature of the good evil first cause, but it had grown to be more and more an independent entity as the centuries rolled over it. This had doubtless come upon, about the reason, about by the reason of the creative energies pouring into it from the various cults, which consciously or unconsciously sucked their lifeblood from its windblown gossamer light vortex. Older than Christianity, older than the Druids, older than the gods of Norsemen or Romans, older than the gods of the Neolithic men, this many-named mystery had been handed down to subsequent generations by three psychic channels, by the channel of popular renown, by the channel of inspired poetry, and by the channel of individual experience. Names are magical powers. Names can work miracles. But the traditional name of this entity... The Holy Grail might easily mislaid an intelligent historian of our planet. The reality is one thing, the name, with all its strange associations, is only an outward shell of some such reality. Apart from the fabulous stories that have become the burden of this wind-blown Newman, it must be noted that as these two figures, this man and this woman, longed to make love to each other but were withheld by circumstances, their intense desire, all the more eclectic, electric, for being as victorious, vicious as it was, was urged by its own intensity, apart altogether from any consciousness in those two as to what was happening, to the very brink of the floating fount of life. The strongest of all physical forces in the world is unsatisfied desire, and the desire of these two, at this moment, gathering electric force out of the atomic air and striving blindly towards each other in despite of the sundering flesh, was so caught up and so heightened by this frustrated desire of 2,000 years, which in the valley had pulsed and jetted and spotted, that it actually drew near to that secret thing. Thus the lovers of these two people, both of them hostile to all these miraculous forces, thus the love of these two people, hostile both of them rooted in fen mud and vicious heathenism did, by reason of their strength of what the old Benedictines would have called their brutish and carnal purpose, approach the invisible rim of this wind-blown mystery. Approached it, but not touch it. With a heavy heart, Mary dragged herself off. Three times she looked back and waved her hand, watching him make his lingering way towards Whirl Hill. Southwest he went. And each time she turned, the afternoon sun seemed more obscuring, more vaporously concealing, more hopelessly swallowing. He seemed to disappear into the golden haze like the knighted arms of the poet, alone and palely loitering. But darkly, not palely, did his figure pass away, vanishing amid the, wet, the yet dark forms of tree trunks, and wall cornices, and wooden water butts, and clothes lines, and garden pumps all mingling together in dim, fantastic, purplish dream stuff. As if the slanting sun rays had hollowed out all substance, all solidly, from both them and him. As hot and perspiring, John toiled up that dusty accent. He saw the boyish countenance of Tom Barter before him. Uh, he was going to see Tom Barter tomorrow evening. Would he prove a complete stranger when he was face to face with him? Tomorrow evening was Saturday. He hoped Mary would be able to reach the place in the ruins in good time. Well, if she were late, he would have to keep Tom waiting. But Tom would not mind. Tom was always good-natured. Tom never got angry. No, he never got angry. Even when the boat was stranded in the mud. Even when the bait was left behind. Even when a float was lost. Even when an oar got adrift even when you kept him waiting for hours. By God, it was Tom, and not with Mary that he had played with that wicked game that day at the bottom of the boat. How extraordinary that he should have mixed up those two like that in his mind. And now we have a new chapter. Chapter 4 or 5? Doesn't say here. Chapter whatever. White Lake Cottage. And I'll begin. Presently. 
When Mr. Decker and his son set out to walk to White Lake River, they decided to cross that particular region in the environs of Lesnabury to which local usage had come to restrict the romantic name of Avalon. Over the uplands known as Stone Down, they directed their way straight to the hamlet of Wick. At this point, Mr. Decker began to take a little surreptitious pleasure in this excursion, independent of its troublesome and complicated purpose. He always loved a long walk with Sam, and there was not a field of a, or a lane within several miles of their home where some rare planter bird, or, as the spring advanced, some butterfly did not arrest their attention. I was telling Mr. Grow, Crow, said Sam's father, about this hamlet. Do you know, it was the one thing I told him that really interested in him. A quaint fellow that Crow seems to be. His last words were spoken in a raised voice, for Sam had moved a little ahead of him and was standing by the side of an immense oak tree which grew at the edge of the lane. Another tree of the same species, equally enormous, grew a stone's throw further on, and these two gigantic living creatures, whose topmost branches were almost thickly sprinkled with small, gamboge yellow leaf buds, appeared to be conversing together in that golden sun haze far up above the rest of the vegetable world and where none but birds could play the eavesdropper. The sight of these two titanic trees, trees that might have witnessed at least a fifth portion of the long historic life of Glastonbury, suggested to the mind of the elder Decker thoughts quite unconnected with either Vikings or Druids. We must try again here this summer for those purple hair streaks, Sam, my boy. But the lad heard his father's words without his accustomed sympathy in an etymological pursuit. His body was at that moment bowed away forward towards the great corrugated trunk, corrugated trunk, his outstretched arms pressed against it, his fingers extended wide. All this he was doing in complete unawareness. Was Sam's gesture at this moment destined to prove the existence of an increasing reapproachment in those latter modern days between certain abnormal human beings such as were both Sam and John, and the subhuman organisms in nature? Was it in fact a token, a hint, a prophecy, or a catastrophic change eminent in human psychology itself? Psychology itself? Across the sole of that immemorial oak tree, as it flowed upward like an invisible mist from the great roots of the earth to those gamboge-colored leaf buds, there had passed more wild November rains, more luminous August moons, more desperate March winds whirling and howling over Queen's Stedgemoor and Wick Hollow than either Sam Decker or his father had any notion of. Then why to the troubled heart of this young man, just then, did there not come from the immense responsibility of the huge tree's vast planetary experience a kind of healing virtue? Why did Sam Decker draw back from this old oak tree uncomforted, unconsoled, unsoothed, uninspired? Against this great rough trunk, many a gypsy donkey had rubbed its gray haunches and got comforted by it. Many a stray heifer had butted with her wanton horns and eased her heart. Squirrels had scampered and scratched there and hung suspended, swaying their tails and scolding. Wrens had built large, green, mossy nests there. Chaffinches had scrapped and pecked at the lichen for their nests, so small, so elegant, in the nearby blackthorn bushes. Past that trunk and its great twin brother, further down the lane, had ridden men in armor, men in Elizabethan ruffles, men with cavalier ringlets, men in 18th century wigs. Many of these, no doubt, jumped down from their horses, drawn by an indescribable indescri magnetic pull, and touched that intended bark with their traveling, swollen, bare hands. Travel swollen. And so many it must have brought luck of some sort to many, some healing wisdom, some wise decisions, some hints of how to heal and deal with their mates, with their offspring, with the tumult of life. But nothing of this sort came to Sam Decker. The son was he of the man who refused to worship the sun. That great reddish orb, now sinking down toward the Bristol Channel, had its own strange superhuman consciousness. And this consciousness, roused to anger against this simple priest, had resolved with a mysterious, envenoming tenacity, corrosive and deadly,
to separate him from the only Earth thing he loved. The two men walked in a silence now. Mr. Decker, instinctively understanding that his son was on tender hooks about this encounter, and beginning himself to feel, in his own sturdy consciousness, certain premonitions of danger in the air. They passed Wick Hollow. They passed Bushy Kikomb. As they went on, they were sometimes compelled to stop and stare at the hedges, for it was weeks since they had been that way, and they were astonished at the extraordinary beauty of the Selendines this year. The ground was uneven, broken up into many little depressions and small hillocks, and whether because February had been exceptionally wet, or because the winds had been so steadily blowing from the west, not only were the petals of the Celadines more glittering than usual, but the leaves were larger and glossier. Celadines were my father's favorite flowers, said Matt Decker, as they moved on again after one of these pauses. It always pleased him to think of his father when he was alone with his son and to speak of him and to him. It made him feel that he, the three of them, three generations of Deckers, were intimately bound together, and bound together, too, with that fecurred Somershire soil. His piety, in this classical sense, was one of the massive, single-hearted motives by which he lived. The landscape around them changed completely now, for they descended from the verdurous island of Avalon down into a confused series of cattle droves, which led across the low-lying water meadows. And we'll stop there today on page uh, 130. <clears throat> so, uh, things are really plowing ahead right now with Glastonbury. And I hope you did enjoy your time there. Until next time, cheers.